right, welcome. Um, this is module one, lecture one. Uh, today we're gonna to be discussing social problems, obviously, and we're gonna be discussing kind of how sociologists define social problems um, and uh, take a specific look at one example of a social problem in society. Um, first of all, we should start off with the idea of you know, social problems being a subdiscipline uh, within sociology. If we take a look at sociology, we clearly know that it's a social science. Uh, in other words, um, we have to rely on facts in order to say the things we say in sociology. Uh, we don't rely on common sense, intuition, common knowledge, any of those kind of definitions. Um, so it's much more alike to what we sometimes call the hard sciences, biology, physics, chemistry, uh, in the sense of its reliance on research uh, to prove the things uh, that we're talking about. So again, this will you know, you'll see this a lot um, in the readings that you do, as well as uh, the requirements that you have in your discussion board posts uh, to present uh, citations to sources to back up the things you're saying. Um, however, sociology, of course, uh, is sometimes called a soft science as opposed to a hard science because of the subjectivity of its very nature. Um, we are humans researching and investigating ourselves. So, um, you know, again, while we're left with the idea of what else could we do, we have to recognize sometimes, though, that the subjective nature of sociology and the fact that we are humans researching ourselves uh, sometimes leaves us in this like little bit of ambiguity um, when it comes to you know how reliable are the things we're saying. Good example would be um, if chimpanzees were to study themselves and report back to us on what they study about themselves would we necessarily take that at face value? So chimpanzees, let's say, have the intelligence and language capability to study themselves and then report back. They might say, chimpanzees are clearly the smartest, strongest, most capable species on the planet, and we don't do anything wrong, and everything we do is perfect. And we as human beings would look at that and say, well, of course you're saying that. You're chimpanzees. You want to look at yourselves in a favorable light. You want to appear to be smart and capable and strong, but we, looking at it from the outside, would say, we kind of have a doubt about what it is that you're saying. So the same applies to human beings. You know, we are, and I'll explain this in just a second when we talk about kind of about our roles in the social structure, we live in society and we are subject to society. We're subject to the socialization process by which we gain the ways of operating in society. So this all leaves us, again, kind of in, in a subjective place. Um, bringing us to the issue then of social problems. So what defines a social problem? And just its very nature, the social definition, the common definition of social problems implies that there's something wrong, right? Uh, that, you know, does social problem equal bad? And the answer sociologically is no, because that's a value judgment. And we as sociologists try very hard not to make value judgments. Once again, very difficult because we are living in society, right? Um, so we could say, for an example, crime. Most people would say, yeah, crime's a social problem. Um, and would we say then that crime equals bad? Well, most people would probably say, yes, it's not good that there is crime in society. A sociologist would say, are there quote unquote good or functional elements to society? And many sociologists would argue yes, right? Um, for those of you who might be criminal justice majors, we're thinking about a career in law enforcement or the legal system. Are you not going to be employed because there's crime in society? Will you not, in fact, have a job because crime exists, whether or not you're a police officer, a lawyer, defense or prosecution, a criminologist, you know, uh, any of these things that study society and studies this phenomenon we call crime. So we know that crime employs millions and millions and millions of people, I myself, for a very long time before Hack uh, made quote unquote a living off the fact that um, people were committing crimes and they were being referred uh, to the agency that I work for for counseling services. So, you know, if you asked me what would happen if all that crime went away tomorrow, my answer would be I'd be out of a job, right? Um, we definitely know that uh, sociologists such as Emile Durkheim, one of the founders of sociological thought, uh, definitely laid out very specific uh, things that, that crime 
does in our society. I'm not going to go into them in great detail here, but it is things like promote social unity and kind of an us versus them mentality uh, provides us with the means of knowing what the rules of society are. Right? When we see people breaking laws, we sometimes then better understand and see the consequences for what those rules are. Um, and also uh, promote social change. Right? A lot of times social change happens because people are breaking rules. Um, the last example I can give you in this does crime equal bad debate uh, might be the subject of, you know, again, some fiction uh, that we've all been familiar with, um, Godfather, Sopranos. This idea of, you know, is organized crime bad? We would probably say yes when it comes to things like extortion and murder and all these other kind of things. But sociologically, we also look at the idea that for many immigrants, organized crime is a path to uh, not only assimilation, but also sometimes success in a country. So, you know, people engage in organized crime and become profit, you know, make profit from it and can actually achieve social mobility, upward social mobility. So for all these reasons, we can, we can make the argument that crime itself is not bad, right? It just is, it exists in society. Now, does that mean crime is good? No, of course not. If you've ever been the victim of crime, which many, many, many of us have, I certainly have, you know, uh, we say no, crime's awful, it creates victims. It, you know, robs people of, of you know, property and, and health and sometimes even life, right? So we have to get to this complex understanding as sociologists about how to regard these issues. So I'm gonna take a quick look over here at how do we define then what a social problem Okay. Um, a social problem is regarded as undesirable in a society when one of two things happens, a significant number of people decide it is, or a number of significant people decide it is, right? So a social problem is just something that exists in society. So we could actually say, we look here, what I've done is kind of draw what I imagine to be a very crude limitation, what the social structure is. What I mean by that is this is society, right? This grid that I have up behind me um, is all the interlockings of groups and organizations and institutions and individuals, right, that we all exist in. So we just you know, metaphorically say, okay, what is society like? Society is like a grid, all sorts of interconnected things, a very functionalist point of view. Um, and we study society by studying all these different groups, individuals, institutions, and their interactions, right? And what we can basically say is a phenomena that happens, right? So let's just say this blob here, right? We'll call this A, right? Um, well, we call A the social structure, and then this would actually be, I'm sorry, B, right? The idea of, you know, something going on in society, a potential social problem, okay, uh, is what we're talking about here. And um, what defines whether or not that thing is a social problem or not? I'm gonna get the camera to zoom in on me here again, which is not, sorry about that, um, is when a group of people, which we call a social movement organization, in somehow interacts with that social problem. So what I've just drawn up there in green and labeled as C, is what we call a social movement organization, SMO, right? And they, again, it's a, either for a large group of people or a number of significant people in society, people of importance, power, prestige, those kind of things, that will decide that the thing B is a social problem. And society will not regard it as a social problem unless that happens, okay? So unless we have that interaction of there we go. Um, between a potential social problem and a social movement organization, then we don't necessarily define that thing as a social problem. And here's a great example. Okay, most of us would probably say, on a, a, a individual level, that child abuse is bad. Right? I don't think there's a lot of people who wouldn't argue that abusing children physically, in this case, we'll, we'll stick with physically, uh, is a bad thing. Right? And a social problem. However, we can ask ourselves, has it always been? Let's just use our society, the United States. And for a very long time in the United States, child abuse, by definition, was not considered a social problem. Okay, you can think back to you know, early parts of the 20th century and before, but I'm gonna stick with the 20th century and go right up from about the 
19, you know, early 1900s to about the 1950s or 60s, um, child abuse was not considered a social problem. Okay, it was often considered a matter of, of family issues. Um, we can also make the case for things like domestic violence, uh, interpersonal partner or inter partner violence as being the same. But for right now, we'll stick with child abuse. Um, in the 1950s, uh, many children who might be brought to an emergency room with a broken arm, okay, I'll be very specific about this, uh, the explanation given by parents or caretakers was he or she or they fell off their bike, right, or fell out of a tree, fell off a fence, whatever else it is. And I'm going to just, I, I put pictures of this up in the module one uh, so you can see this a little bit better, but if I'm holding up my very own wrist, right, when a bone is broken, we know there's two bones to the wrist, right, or the, or the arm, uh, lower part of the arm. Uh, what's called a distal fracture is near the wrist and transverse, meaning across both bones, relatively in the same area. This is the type of fracture that is caused when someone falls, right? Adult skiing, you know, whatever else it is, uh, could do it this way. But for children, when they fall off a bike, fall out of a tree, fall off a fence, they'll break their wrist and it'll go across both bones. Most of the time. A spiral fracture is when a bone is broken here and on the other bone over here, right? So you have one bone broken here and one bone broken there, okay? It's called a spiral fracture. And the reason most commonly for given or cause of this type of fracture is by an arm being twisted, okay? And again, you can imagine a parent perhaps being violent with a child would probably grab a child by the arm, twist their arm, pull them, something like that, and the bone would break here and here, right? So what would happen is emergency room physicians, nurses, uh, social workers would see children coming into emergency rooms with spiral fractures, right? And the explanation being given was he or she or they fell off their bike, okay? Um, didn't make sense. Those two, the explanation does not jive with the injury, okay? But for the most part, doctors, nurses, other professionals said, okay, parent, uh, you know best, and we're going to set your child's arm and send you the child home with you, okay? Um, and very little reporting was done on suspected cases of child abuse. Um, basically, by the 1960s, Physicians, police officers, social workers kind of said enough. And what didn't happen overnight, it didn't happen to any one person. We can't point to the day that this happened. But basically enough people started saying, hey, there are too many injuries being done to children that aren't consistent with the medical facts, right, of what we know probably happened to these children. And when these people started mobilizing and organizing, and started saying, okay, we need to do something about this. That's when a social movement organization, SMO, begins, right? Somebody says, this is a problem, right? And whether or not it starts off with a very large number of people and then gets more people involved. So you could say, okay, now it's up to, you know, doctors and nurses to talk to police and police have to start to talk to prosecuting attorneys and prosecuting attorneys have to start getting together and, and going to lawmakers and saying, okay, we need some regulations regarding this, okay? And pretty soon, again, there's not a strict timeline for this, this issue of children's broken arms equals now child abuse, right? Because a significant number of people said that it was. Um, and now, of course, if you work within the fields of anything having to do with working with children, a teacher or a social worker, you know we have very strict laws regarding reporting of child abuse. So now if a child comes into the emergency room with a spiral fracture and the parent says he or she or they fell off their bike, the physician's now required by law to report that inconsistency. Okay, So something that was not a social problem became a social problem because of social movement organizations. So again, we can talk real quickly about some drawbacks to this. Um, again, it's an inconsistent process, right? How do we know what a significant number of people is or a number of significant people? It's sometimes very difficult to define. Uh, another issue is, again, one of the things I left out here, if this is the social structure, you know, this is 
you, right? You are the sociologist in question. My video just turned off. Sorry about that. You are the person living in here, right? And notice I put this sociologist outside of this. What if you, the sociologist, were an abused child yourself, right? Or an abuser and guilty of that behavior? Would that affect the way that you would study this? You know, and the answer is, of course, yes, because sociologists are human beings and are part of the social structure. Um, two things that this allows us to do uh, is, to, again, define why some things were not considered social problems and now are, and what are some phenomenons that, phenomena, that are even related to the same issue. Crime. I'll go back to that example for a second. Uh, we sometimes define crime as both social, or we could define it as street crime, the crime that happens, you know, uh, on the level of individuals such as robbery, rape, murder, um, and corporate crime, right? Do we treat those things differently in our society? So just the fact that we have this kind of definition, sociological definition of a social problem um, has both advantages and disadvantages. Okay. 